Oh, hey, YouTube. Uh, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about uh, weight loss lately. Uh, I'm down to 272. My pl plateau is over. Uh, got about, oh, last week I didn't miss any days, and I did 111 miles this week. Missed two days because of rain. It was just raining too hard. If it's just spitting a little bit, I'll go out. But when it's raining downpouring, I, it's just no fun. And it's too, no fun when it's cold. When it's warm, it's a non-issue. But cold, it, it uh, really uh, makes you close to hypothermic, even wearing warm clothes. Because you can't keep your appendages, your hands, and your feet real warm. I really don't have a problem with my feet when I'm exercising. It's only when I'm sitting still. Uh, fall is squarely here. Uh, there isn't going to be any warm days. No 60 degree days even in our for the rest of the month here. Uh, so we're... We're starting to see an average of like 52, 53 degrees, which it is today. Uh, but allergies are really bad, even though I take a daily allergy. Well, I take two allergy medications. The fall is here. The leaves, there's still quite a bit of green, but it's really starting to color out here. Yeah, the maples are all losing their leaves already, and now we're starting to see the oaks and the uh, and the other trees turn turn color. So uh, the bike I, it's, now I'm at the point that I'm taking my ba battery off my truck and taking it in, and charging it indoors, and leaving it indoors so that it's at least 70 degrees. Oh, when it comes out here, uh, you, you still lose a lot of range. It really doesn't matter what you start with, but when it's cold out, you start losing range. It takes more effort for that chain to turn around, uh, all kinds of things. You need to use a thinner lubrication on the chain, and uh, the wax doesn't work real well when it's cold, so keep that in mind that the chain wax products don't work well in the cold and they don't if the, it's wet they don't work well at all because uh, they wash off uh, the roads are a little more rough uh, the leaves add a, another element of danger to your ride and you keep that in mind uh, when you are riding on pavement treat them like they're snow because they can be slick and knock you off your bike in a second. Out here on the trails, what they hide is uh, things that you might not see, sticks, rocks, that kind of stuff. So you have to ride with a bit of caution, maybe slow down a little bit when you're out on the trails in the fall. Uh, leaves aren't so bad on this trail, but there's still quite a bit. And they typically, there's branches underneath them and all kinds of stuff so I got to really be careful when I'm out on the trail uh, so uh, there were some questions I I seen on our Facebook group uh, electric bike owners I used to belong to a bunch of them but I subscribe and unsubscribe almost as quick as I did is anything because there's always somebody that gets on there that don't matter how much experience you have or how little experience they have they're convinced that something's a certain way and I just give up I don't argue with them anymore I just unsubscribe let them pass on that baloney that they're telling everybody when the fact is they probably ride their bike five miles a month and think they know know the ins and outs of everything. Uh, there is a lot of good channels out there on YouTube that do provide good information. There's quite a few. 
and quite a few of them are watching other YouTube videos to come to a conclusion on how to do something. And as long as you don't take one source as the absolute, even with me, you shouldn't take what I know as absolute because there might be a better way of doing something out there. And I sometimes I even look and see if there's a better way to do something. But when it comes to bicycle basics, they're just bicycles. If a person calls them a bike mechanic, there's really not much to it. If there's all they ever do is change parts. A lot of people that work in bike shops don't even know how to true wheels anymore. They got their one guy in the shop that's been around for a long time. He does all the stuff that would normally back in the day would have been done by anybody in the shop. Uh, yeah. So uh, this year I'm going to uh, buy a bleed kit for these brakes and change the fluid. Not so much because they're any different, but I have noticed that when it's really cold outside, say in the 40s, and I go out for a ride, the the brakes are a little stiff, so I'm thinking that somehow they're they're gathering moisture. It's a closed system. They shouldn't be able to, but they do. It doesn't matter. Even your car is a closed system in a way, and they gather uh, moisture in the fluid. So I'm going to dump the fluid, bleed the brakes uh, sometime this, this winter. Uh, Rotors, they, they're still straight and true. Pads aren't even close to knee and change. Two thousand. That's the thing with resin pads. If you keep this in mind, the resin pads don't stop usually as well as metallic pads, but the resin pads seem to wear longer. Almost every bike that uh, the cheaper end of the spectrum all has uh, metallic pads. And they're a mixture of uh, copper and other metallics, but the copper's there to keep them from sticking to the rotor. Uh, if you got your brakes hard enough, hot enough, say going down a hill, and they didn't have that copper, and you could literally weld your pads to the rotor. So there's a little bit of copper. It could be in the form of brass, but most of the time it's just straight copper in the pads that keeps those pads from welding to the rotor. Uh, Michigan don't have hills long enough to worry about such things. Uh, I, the question has come up in the, the groups of between mid-drive and, and hub-drive. A lot of people are asking should they buy the mid-drive bike or a hub-drive bike. And it really depends on your situation and where you ride. It's that's the biggest answer right there. If you ride in hilly uh, conditions where you're in the uh, lower part of your, uh, I mean, like in your last two cogs, lowest cogs, then you probably should be riding a mid-drive bike just for the simple reason of heat. Hub drives do not handle heat well. They're, the magnets are not mechanically attached. They're glued in on the hub drive motor and uh, the glue tends to fail fairly rate I mean you're not gonna you're not gonna get a hundred thousand miles or or even probably 20,000 miles out of a hub motor for the most part without having to repair something it has three hall sensors in the motor that are glued on and that's how your bike decides uh, how fast you're going uh, when, it, whereas in on this Bosch hub motor, uh, I mean mid-drive, it has a magnetic a magnet sensor and a magnet on the wheel. Uh, simple system, doesn't really ever mess up unless you destroy the sensor. Uh, so, and so you, their weakness is heat. So if you're riding in a hilly uh, situations, or you know you're going to do a lot of traveling where you're going to be riding in hilly trails or hilly roads, consider a mid-drive. 
uh, just for the simple reason is they're going to uh, take the heat from the motor a lot better. They've got this big uh, magnesium or aluminum housing that surrounds the motor and it gives it a place for them to dissipate heat whereas in the uh, hub drive this the motor housing is sealed and there's no way the only way for the heat to escape is through the magnets and out the outside of the hub which is aluminum for the most part some of them are steel but the majority of the aluminum and uh, it uh, also dissipates a little heat but it's not if you it's like being in a uh, sealed room basically with the heater on the heat can't go anywhere but in the room so keep that in mind that's the biggest deciding factor is where you ride in your the conditions you ride in uh, hub hub drives are heavy in the back end and that in a way is good because uh, most of your braking is done in the front wheel 70% of your braking is done in the front wheel Oh, thought I heard a person talking, but it's uh, geese flying overhead. Uh, mid drives have their center of gravity lower, so it gives you a better balanced bike. Uh, tie the weights in the center of the bike, so it's distributed between the two wheels instead of this, just the back wheel. Uh, and weight plays an important role in tire wear. The more you have on the back wheel the faster it's going to wear out uh, it, for example on my XP I wear the back tire out oh with before I get to a thousand miles usually it's around 900 miles I really don't have much tread left and then it's time to rotate and then you take the front tire that looks like it's had nowhere put it in the back and rotate the uh, back tire to the front tire uh, and you end up maybe between the two tires getting 1500 miles at a set of tires but it's just a hassle of having to rotate it uh, so there's advantages in with this bike i i can get about 2000 miles out of the back tire before it's time to re, either rotate or replace uh, the front tire is the original one i'm not even sure how many miles i have on the bike now uh, I got to turn it on. Oh, 1,924 miles. So I'm getting to the 2,000 mile range. I'll probably finish 2,000 miles this week. It's Sunday here. So, Sunday today, this. I post my videos the same day with very little editing. I don't usually edit anything out. Uh, I have editing software, and if I use, if I want to combine two videos, or I need to take out a part where somebody said, stops me and talks to me for half an hour, I usually do do edit those parts out. Uh, but for the most part, you get the videos unedited. It is windy today. I had a guy be that I passed, he caught up to me and passed me again here when I sat down. And he was out on a fat tire regular bike and you could tell the wind was kicking his butt. He'd slow down quite a bit as soon as he, the wind hit him in the face. Uh, and it's, that's the bad part about running, riding on a windy day is you, on a regular bike, it's like, somebody added 100 pounds to your bike when you're out there riding so uh, so in my opinion for the most part mid drives the way to go for a bike hub drive is okay if you're in Michigan you could probably ride a hub drive bike no problem without anything uh, for for efficiency of the 
if you shift the gears like you're supposed to, the mid drive is more efficient. If you're one of those people that leaves in seventh gear and rides your bike all the time in that gear, then you're not using the efficiency of the mid drive motor. It's you have to shift. There's no way around it. And especially on a class one bike, you have no way not to shift. If you don't shift, you're not going to get up the hills because uh, a 250 watt motor is a uh, 250 watts and any a thousand watts uh, like uh, my electric is uh, my the 1.0 they made really two generations of 1.0 uh, that uh, they called it the 1.5 where they updated some software and some different things on it but it essentially was uh, the same bike and the 1.0 is truly a thousand watt bike. Uh, it has a 20 amp controller versus the other bikes which have 18 amp controller. Uh, they, I, I think Electric decided that to get a little more range out of their bikes, they were going to tune down the controller so it couldn't dry as many watts. I mean, on a thousand watt controller, you can drain that 500 watt battery in 30 minutes easy. Sometimes even less, depends on how hard you're pushing it. Because uh, you can't use the entire thousand watts, I mean 500 watts. There's a point where the battery just starts dying because of battery sag. Uh, and that is a direct result of electric not using big enough battery cells. Uh, if you're going to have a 20 amp load, you should use cells that are rated at 20 amps. Uh, they use cells that are rated at less than that. I don't know because I've never opened up the battery and looked and tried to figure out uh, which battery cells they have in the, the bike. They say uh, on the early bikes, they had two options, the LG and the Samsung option. Uh, the capacity was the same, but what amps those cells were rated at is another thing. Uh, so part of the problem with the battery sag is just they didn't use the right cells. They cheaped out and got the lower amp rated cells so they could make a cheaper battery. I'm sitting here looking at those 14 amp batteries the other day. Uh, for a Karen's bike, the long range batteries, and I'm thinking, you could, first of all, you can only put it on one of the batteries, and that's the back battery. You can buy a 14 amp rated battery for the back, which would be about 600 and some watts, uh, but it would add weight. So I weighed the batteries on the uh, her batteries when I brought them in for the winter. 16 pounds a pair of them, eight pounds a piece. They call it seven point something, 7.4, 7.5. Well, my scale, my uh, my kitchen scale that goes to 10 pounds, say they weigh eight pounds. And it's pretty accurate as near as I can tell. I was trying to get me. So uh, 16 pounds. And uh, it is the bike, when they say weighs 75 pounds, that's with one battery. That's not with both of them. And it's with the battery that's in the frame. The uh, the one that's on the back of the X Premium does, isn't included in the weight. So when you w go buy your racks for your bike, you need to take that in into effect. It, it weighs 85 pounds. Uh, so if you're putting your bike on a rack, which I don't understand, why buy a folding bike if you're going to put it on a rack? beyond me um, if you're buying a rack you, you really need to consider that one that 85 pounds is with zero accessories on that's without a bag or a water bottle carrier or a foam carrier or anything that's without anything on it and you need to take that into a, account because I've seen some people that are rocking 20 pounds of accessories on the front of their bike. Well, I should get going. There's a person walking down the trail. I need to get home. I got a roast in the oven. Hope you all have a great day.